Hey, what's up, guys? Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com once again. Uh, except today I am joined by a special guest, my new friend, Kimberly Quinlan. Uh, Kim is host of the Anxiety Toolkit podcast, which just gets rave reviews from anybody I ever heard that mentions it. So, Kim, thank you for taking the time um, to come on today. I really appreciate it. Of course. I'm happy and, to be here. Uh, Kimberly is an OCD specialist. She's a therapist that's practicing in California here in the US of A. And uh, why don't you take a few seconds and give us an idea of where you're coming from and, and what you do and, and uh, you know, just kind of background and what's going on. Sure. Well, I have the awesome job of being an OCD specialist or an anxiety specialist here in California. I see clients in my private practice. And basically what that means is I get to teach people how to face their fears, which is a wonderful job because even though it's scary for the person doing it, they end up coming out on the other end so empowered and feel like they finally got a grasp on how to manage their anxiety. So mm -hmm. there's the private practice piece. And then I also have for those who don't have access to a therapist, which is a lot of people because unfortunately... Mm -hmm. There are very few therapists who understand how to treat OCD. I also have online programs for people who don't have access to therapy. And that's more in the terms of anxiety courses and OCD yeah. courses. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. And for you, unfortunately, we should probably address this right away. Not being licensed outside of California, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because you're going to get contacted. I know you will. Uh, well, and that was my dilemma. So like I said, I'm so blessed to work with the clients that I have. But unfortunately, I'm only legally allowed to treat people in California or within a country that allows me to treat them. Basically, what that means is they're an unregulated teletherapy country. Right. Now, the problem with this is people were contacting me saying, please, I live in this state and I have to drive three hours to a therapist and even then they don't really get it and and please what can you do to help me and I was feeling so sad because mm -hmm. I literally had no place to turn them to yeah. um, like I, I couldn't even refer them to a, a sort of good option so that was the reason why I created the courses which is basically the first five course four sessions I would have with a client on teaching them what exposure therapy looks like, what they need to be doing, what they tools right. they need to be putting on. Makes sense. Cool. Great story. Well, I'm happy that you took the time today because um, as we talked about in our previous discussion, a lot of the folks that are listening today that, that follow my podcast, my videos in the Facebook group um, are deal with some measure of OCD. Usually the discussion centers around intrusive thoughts more so than those compulsions that everybody hears about, like hand washing and checking and things of that or counting, but it's mainly intrusive thoughts. And they often come along with that larger anxiety complex of panic disorder with or without agoraphobia, sometimes general anxiety disorder. And it is a tremendous topic of discussion in my community. But how, okay, so I understand if I'm afraid to drive the type of exposures I need to do to get back in the car and face my panic, but how do I deal with these thoughts that won't turn off? And I think that's pretty much a bunch of people did ask in my Facebook group. And if you're watching and you're not in the group, I'll put a link in the description. Go ahead and join. Everybody's welcome. But all the questions that were asked, and I'm going to scroll while we do this, um, are almost all the same. They're asking about different thoughts. Some people are mm -hmm. focused on a fear of death. Some people are focused on a terrible accident. You, you understand. They're all right. irrational and obsessive thoughts that people are having a hard time controlling. Um, so we'll, we'll talk to, about a few specific ones, but maybe we should talk about that in general. And right. in my community, we, we deal a lot with, with actually an Australian, Dr. Claire Weeks. I don't know if you're familiar with Claire Weeks and, uh, and her work. Uh, but we, we talk a lot about that stuff and that floating and facing and accepting and, you know, kind of the basis of the exposure and facing the fear. But that doesn't necessarily apply exactly when it comes to cognitive behaviors like intrusive and obsessive thinking. Am I correct? Right. So the thing to first remember about OCD is no matter what the topic OCD has chosen, mm -hmm. we do treat them all the same. Um, and the way that we really, in an easy way to understand OCD is that there's always, it starts with what is, will be either an intrusive thought or an intrusive sensation. It could be an intrusive emotion, right? Maybe mm -hmm. guilt or shame or, you know, something like that. 
Or in addition, something that doesn't get it talked about a lot would be an intrusive urge, which would be this urge like you're going to do something dangerous or you're going mm -hmm. to do lose control. When you have that, it's uncomfortable. Nobody likes it. It's a horrible feeling. And naturally, our instinct is to run away from it, do something to make it go away, to control it. Mm -hmm. um, and what we want to do is we want to first really look at the concept around OCD and remember that the thought is not actually the problem. The problem is how we react to that <sighs> thought. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we speak the same language. Anyway, we sorry. Do. And yeah. so it's important for people to know, often we get really caught up in like, what does it mean about me if I'm having an intrusive thought about harming someone or or doing some terrible action or some very you know graphic thought? What, what does that mean? And the important thing is, again, as I said, is to, to not focus on the content of your thoughts, but instead to really look at how am I reacting to this thought and how is that reaction actually cycling us back into the cycle to have more of those thoughts? Mm -hmm. Not that it's anybody's fault or that you're, you're causing them, but right. it's, it's true. How we react to our experience can change how the brain reacts to it in the future. Yeah. I find that people are so, when you're dealing with things like agoraphobia, where somebody develops a fear of being out of the house or even in a specific room in their house, they're always afraid of how they're going to feel in that situation. And those are easier. They're often externalized, even though we talk all the time about how it's really a reaction that's causing this. It's not the room or the supermarket. But when it's thoughts, I think it becomes harder because you cannot externalize You know, there's no outside influence there. This is things in my own head that I'm having a hard time dealing with. You know, and, and how do I deal with that? So you're, I, I like the idea where it's the reaction to the thought, but we have to go past the idea that you just have to, and there's a lot of discussion about this. Are you just supposed to accept them? Are you supposed to just let them be there? Am I supposed to distract myself? We have people who swear that meditation is the way to go with this. So many different things, but it's mm -hmm. an active process, isn't it? This is not a sit back and just ignore them thing. There's work to actually do, isn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So well, I think the main thing to remember is metaphorically, it's how you greet the thought. So if you, let's say metaphorically, a, a hor your horrible neighbor comes to your door mm -hmm. and you open the door and slam the door in its face. He, your neighbor's going to be a little upset with you or, you know, raise some, some trouble. It, the yeah. same goes with intrusive thoughts. So I think the first step is always to really address how you're greeting or welcoming this thought into your day. So mm -hmm. an important thing to remember here is an actual tool that we use in therapy. It's actually derived from acceptance and commitment therapy. Mm -hmm. which is the, the technique or tool of learning how to observe a thought mm -hmm. instead of fuse with a thought, right. right? So the work here is being able to notice, oh, I'm having a thought about, I'm going to like use triggering words, but I'm having a thought about killing my husband or mm -hmm. I'm having a thought about have that accident happening. Or if you have health anxiety, it might be I'm having a thought about getting cancer and dying. Mm -hmm. So it's first being able to observe and diffuse from those thoughts. Again, that's sort of how you greet it. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself can be enough for some people. Mm -hmm. But if you're really stuck and let's say you've been dealing with this and you've been reacting to it for some time, that probably won't be enough and you will need to engage in exposure and response prevention, which is mm -hmm. a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy, all of what I'm talking about here is scientifically proven. Like none of this has been pulled out of my back pocket. Right. Um, and so exposure and response prevention to thoughts would be around what we would write an imaginal or a script about that terrible thought coming true. Mm -hmm. And then I would actually have you play around with it in creative ways. So let's say if you were afraid of harming someone, if you were my client, um, and this is what I teach in the course as well, is I would have you write this terrible, horrible story. I get you, like, it's horrible. And I, I want to always preface it with, you know, this is not easy work. Right. I always make the joke with people is you should not want to see me. If you want to see me, I'm doing something wrong. Right. 
Because right? you're going to make them do this hard work. <laughs> exactly. I hear, I hear it In the, the time. kindest way possible. I, right. I want you not to look forward to seeing me. Um, and so we would write those scripts. But then let's say, like I said, if you had a fear of harming, I might have you walk around the streets with a pocket knife right? Or I might have you listen to sounds of gunshots, or I might have you, uh, you know, we can get really creative. This is why I love my job. It's like kind of sadistic in a way in that we get to come up with very creative ways to have fun with fear. And ultimately through that process, you're basically showing fear that you're going to bring it on Mm -hmm. and you're showing fear that I'm going to stare you down. And we're going to have the staring down contest, right? And I'm going to win, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just the same that we talk about in dealing with a panic attack. Mm-hmm. Same exact thing. So it's yeah. experiential learning. When, you, when yeah. you stare it down and nothing actually happens, you've taught your brain, oh, I didn't have to fear that thought. Right. Uh, yeah. Or even if something does happen, that mm-hmm. you can handle it, right? Right, like, right. Like even if, you know, if you, someone has a really bad fear of, of having an accident, you know, I'm not going to tell someone to purposely rear end somebody's car as an exposure. <laughs> but if for any reason they do it, our work here with fear mm-hmm. isn't just about proving it won't happen. It's about proving that we can handle and master any emotion right. that rises when things get difficult. Well, I think we, we, I see two different things, actually two or three different things that come up a lot. And in the questions that were posted, when I told people I would be talking to you, generally speaking, health anxiety is huge. So the fear there is, uh, and, and the overriding question is no matter how many times the doctor tells me that I'm fine and the 50 different tests I've had and the 16 specialists have all told me I'm fine. I still won't believe it. What do I do? There's that one. Mm-hmm. And then there, so there are rational or f- things that can actually happen. You can have a car accident. That's true. You know, so you can get sick. It's possible you can get sick. But then there are also thoughts about completely irrational things that simply will not happen and people can't let go of those. But I, I'm guessing that the, the process is the same. We often talk about learning to identify when those thoughts happen. Oh, this is one of those. Now, how do I greet it? Like you said. You know, how do I react to it? How do I interact with it? We talk about not getting into an, an internal dialogue with it because mm-hmm. you, you'll never win the argument. The right. what, if, what if always wins? So people, the overriding question is how, how do I answer? What if? What if always wins? But right. you could teach people how to not let what if win. That's an actual skill that they can learn, I'm guessing. Well, it's basically through the lens and the practice of being uncertain. Mm. The only way to trump OCD is through uncertainty. To be okay with uncertainty. Because think it through, and this is how tricky OCD is. So let's Hmm. say you have health anxiety, you go to the doctor, he says, nothing is wrong, you're good. Mm -hmm. And then you leave the office, you have a short time period of relief. And then as you're walking out of the office, you see someone else walk in who looks unwell and you go, what if he missed something? Right. It's always what if he missed something. Right. What if, yeah. how, and, and then you might go, no, no. And then you might even have the MRI in your hand and you'd be like, look here. And you're do all you're doing is a re- reassurance seeking compulsion. Right. And even if you're holding it and you've got clear evidence in front of you, I always sort of externalize OCD and make him into kind of a jokester. I mm-hmm. always tell my clients, he literally sits back and he close crosses his arms and he goes, are you sure? Right. Oh, we and, talk about and, that all the time. Right. And, yeah. and he can, and OCD and anxiety can pull out the are you sure card any time. Yeah. And if? the own right. And so the thing for us to work in is to lean in and be like, you know what? I actually don't I don't want to know anymore. I'm going to work at not knowing. Yeah. It's, and then it, it can go on and on and on. Yeah. And no you cannot overcome the I'm gonna be uncertain card. That's the one thing that will get you through. So yeah. the answer to the question is it's through the practice of uncertainty. Now what I tell people in my office in and in, in the courses as well is I want you to think of uncertainty like a very weak muscle in your body. And mm-hmm. the only way to strengthen it is by practicing it, just like doing push-ups or bicep curls. You can't expect uncertainty to work if you haven't practiced it a lot. And so if you're faced with a problem or or a a thought or a fear or a sensation or an urge, you have to ask yourself, am I going to pick this up with my compulsive arm or am I going to pick this up with my uncertain arm? Whichever one you pick it up with is the one that will get stronger. 
And right. and the goal here is to get an uncertainty arm that's so strong that it it becomes the habit. You know, we are very much habits of, creatures of habit. So if you're used to picking up things with a compulsion, mm-hmm. you you know in you know what it's like when you're anxious. Yeah. It's hard to think through things. You can't think rationally. Your limbic right. brain is winning. So it's about the work here is working while you're anxious and while you're not anxious at strengthening that uncertainty muscle. Mm-hmm. And strengthening those the uncertainty muscle, which I really love. I actually like that concept. When And we talk a lot of times in my community about, I've actually said things like positive self-talk is bullshit in the middle of things because you can't argue with your limbic brain in the midst of it. So I'm right. guessing that when you are calm and rational, you're doing a certain set of exercises and those hopefully will become automatic behaviors so that when the shit hits the fan, you automatically know what to do. Is that, I'm guessing that's what you would be teaching people. It is, it is. I mean, mean, that to a degree. So Mm -hmm. I agree with what you're saying, but I always, always sort of make a point in that the limbic part of our brain, the anxious part of our brain that gets lit up when we have fear is, is built to prepare us to run. That's what reason. it's actually for. Right. So there will never be a day where you naturally want to be uncomfortable and mm-hmm. naturally want to be. You will always default to running away. That's just mm-hmm. the human brain. Thank goodness we're grateful for that part of the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but the practice is with enough practice of being uncertain, you will actually connect the limbic brain with more of that upper, higher part of the brain, the more higher functioning part of the brain or the prefrontal cortex, and that will step in sooner than what it would if you hadn't practiced that uncertainty. So I, I'm, I'm just being picky with that because I don't want people to think that they'll one day always have that as being their normal response. That makes sense. Yeah, that does make mm-hmm. sense because the and it's practice like anything else. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Yep. But it's it's this is practice doing hard things and facing Ugh. these thoughts and welcoming them in, welcoming them in and people go down that road where they're trying to shut them out. Let's talk for a second about distraction. Mm-hmm. Like most people will find in just about any of the anxiety situations, be they cognitive or overt, like a panic attack. If I get it, they color or they use those little devices. I get on the phone, I talk to somebody, they get out of their own head and suddenly everything seems to be better, which is great, except what happens when you can't color. So I don't know, how does that play in, in your practice and what you're teaching people? And I would think with thoughts, distraction is a huge strategy for, I'm guessing many people, they just want to distract or drown them out. Right. Sometimes you can't drown them out. And what happens? You're not actually building resiliency and skills. If you just run from them and distract, I'm guessing. Right. Well, the science behind this is a concept of what we call thought suppression. So Mm -hmm. what we know in science is that if I put you in a room um, and I put you a little on a table, this is the science experiment they did. Forgive me if your your crowd know this already, but if I put you in a room, brought 15 people in and I said, okay, everyone gets their own desk for the next 15 minutes. I want you to not think about white elephants. Mm -hmm. Here's a button. If you happen to accidentally think about white elephants, you have to press the button, right? So everyone sits there and does that. And then the 15 minutes is over. Everyone leaves. Then they bring the same 15 people in and say, okay, for the next 15 minutes, you can think about whatever you want. If you want to think about white elephants, you can, if you, if you happen to think about it, hit this button, which group thinks about the most white elephants. Yeah, the people that aren't supposed to. Right. <laughs> right, because exactly. The, because the act of trying not to think about something is the action of thinking about it. Correct. Right? Yes. So thought suppression never works. Never works. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and so we definitely don't want to do that. Now, distraction is a tool that is used in dialectical behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. That's mostly for people who have such strong emotions that they are self-harming, suicidal, um, going to make very poor decisions for themselves and their health. Mm -hmm. Um, And so distraction has been a good tool for people who are really heightened. But the problem was if, even though with people with anxiety are technically very heightened, the distraction ends up acting as a thought suppression, right? So it's not effective. It's really confusing because people see people talking about distraction, but it's actually, this is where John Hirschfield, a very good friend of mine who's written a lot of books on OCD, always Mm. says, that's for them, 
not for me, right? Okay. Distraction is good for other people, but not for the person or the brain with OCD. Right. The same as, as you go into a hospital, there's always going to be like the antibacterial wipe things. That's good for everyone who doesn't have OCD. But if you have contamination, that's really not for you, right? Yeah, that right. Makes that makes sense. sense. Yes, that actually so makes what sense. We, so what we do is we practice allowing the thought, but you don't have to sit there and just think about the thought. You can then engage in activities, but the thought comes with you. Mm -hmm. So you might say something along the lines of, I thought about killing people Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Yeah. I really need to go get the groceries. Why don't you and I come and go get groceries together? Mm -hmm. And if you want to show up, you can show up whenever you want. I know that you've got a lot to say, but let's go get the groceries. Let's go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in other words, it's not, that's a different reaction as opposed to, oh no, here it is. Let me right. sit down and have a chat with it all day long. It's, right. it's a slightly different thing. Um, well, it's this balance between you're, you're allowing it, but you're also not engaging with it the whole time. It's right. sort of the metaphor of you can come, but you can sit in the back seat. You're not telling me where to drive. Yeah, exactly. Chat if you might. And yeah. maybe I'll listen or maybe I won't. We yeah. sometimes use the analogy of the infant screaming in your face or the toddler that really wants ice cream. <laughs> and every parent has done this. You let them scream and ignore right. them. That right. is the same thing. No matter how much it screams in your face, just keep doing what you're doing. Exactly. Like, let it let it scream. Yeah, exactly. Right. So these are all really valuable things. And and some I was just scrolling through some of the questions that came up. And like I said, they're all along the same lines for the most part. Uh, very few people, at least in my community, seem to deal with actual physical compulsions like checking or tapping or any of those things. It seems to all be cognitive. So I, I think we've covered a lot of that to a sense. But one of them came up. And yes, health anxiety is uncertainty existential and death anxiety, certainty, like, yes, we're all going to go today is not that day, or maybe it is who knows. Right. Right. But, um, one person asked, uh, it's that whole be gentle to yourself thing. And we talk about this in relation to overcoming panic disorder and agoraphobia, give yourself the space. How far should you go? A lot of times the gentle approach sometimes backfires and creates so much space in my head that I have this endless loop of ruminating. So I think this is this is a topic that comes up all the time when we're talking about physical exposures and that whole like, oh, I know it was hard. It's okay. Be kind to yourself. Like have, have a cup of tea. You don't have to do it today. No, no, you do have to do it today. So do the same rules kind of apply in your situation. Like yeah. you don't get to take, I always tell people there's no days off until you know that there's a day off. Like <laughs> there's no day off because you want a day off. You'll know when it's time right. for a day off. There's no days off from this. So do you find right. that you're in the same boat with your clients or? Right. I, I really, imp- yes, absolutely. Not only my clients, myself included, like sure. let's just be real. <laughs> um, I, I had a really wonderful conversation with Kristen Neff, who is the, very, very well-known researcher in the, in the area of Mm self-compassion and the way that she frames it and the new research about that, which is so awesome Mm -hmm. is we've misunderstood self-compassion and self-care as only doing gentle, slow things like having a bath and candles and fair and cotton candies and And backing away from challenge. Yes, yes. Yes. But that is one component of self-compassion. There are two. And it's what they call it is the yin and the yang of self-compassion. So the Mm -hmm. yin is that very maternal, like, how can I hold you in close to my heart kind of thing, which is very important, particularly given that intrusive thoughts usually come with a ton of shame. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's also the yang of self-compassion or self-care, which is Doing the thing that will propel you to actually live the life you want. The most the self-care isn't just sitting on the couch. Self-care is sometimes doing the really hard thing. And you're doing it because you want long-term happiness and joy and pleasure right. and, and, and wonderful experiences. Right. But the thing to remember is ERP and it, so all of the work I do must have both. And I tell people it's a, it's a flow. So you, you'll flow in and out of yin and yang and you'll do an exposure and then you'll be gentle and then you'll lean back in. And then, mm-hmm. and so it's this flow that we have to get into, but both needs to be there. 
often it's the you have to do the stuff when you most don't want to do the stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the time to do it. So uh, I would imagine the same rules apply in your sphere, which is great. Yeah. Um, we've been going for about 25 minutes. I don't want to go too much longer. So I don't want to take up too much of your time and, um, we can go for hours and hours on this, I think, hmm. but yeah. social anxiety also seems to have a big obsessive component. It appears, um, with some of my people, they, they get obsessed with those things that feed into those feelings of rejection and inadequacy. And I'm checking my phone eight zillion times to see if that person finally responded to my text, because if they don't, I feel a certain way. So do you find that there's a big connection there? Social anxiety mm-hmm. comes, yeah, the, the obsessive parts of social anxiety. Same there rules apply, is. I'm guessing. Like you said, same the rules same always rules, apply. The same rules apply. I think that the thing to remember with social anxiety is um, we actually do a small amount of cognitive therapy, way less behavioral therapy mm-hmm. um, with um than than OCD treatment. Um, right. So sometimes we do sort of have to work through some often um, – ultimately errors in thinking mm-hmm. around like, you know, that people will reject me if I'm sweating or so forth. Whatever. But think of that as one, for me, it's one session maybe, you mm-hmm. know, with OCD, I don't spend a ton of time correcting thoughts with people because that becomes a compulsion. Yep. Um, so yep. with ex- social anxiety, we do sort of work through a couple of errors in thinking, but then 100%, we stare that fear down. We, you know, we walk across to the street where I have this awesome outdoor mall and we ask people for quarters and we, you know, we ask to borrow pens and we give compliments and that's the work we do. Yeah. Which I'm guessing, I know a few of the people that will be watching, it sounds like their worst nightmare, but, <laughs> but that's what you have to do. Do the things right. you don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is so right. great. So great. But, yeah. um, do you have any, uh, so many people struggle for so long, they are not even aware what they have. They don't know that these resources exist. And let's talk for a second about how hard it is to find not only an OCD specialist, which honestly, you're the first person that I've come across in my travels that that will say that you are an OCD specialist, which I really commend, but just cognitive behavioral therapy and its variants in general. So we're dealing with people many, many times who have just been dealing with a general practitioner and a prescription pad or a psychiatrist and a prescription pad or holistic medicine or all kinds of different things that for years on end. So how would you find if you're in California, somebody might be able to find you. But if you're somewhere else, resources, how, how do you go right. about finding this person? Absolutely. So the yeah. very first place to go is the International Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Foundation. Okay. Um, you can go to iocdf.org. I will and link what that. they have, they have an, a um, directory of therapists who have training in ERP. But the thing is, to remember for people and this is the main if you walk away with one message today it's this is the it's about the questions you ask unfortunately the time by the time i see a client in my office they're hopeless they've been told by multiple other therapists that i can help you i do cbt Uh, oh you know and then i do anxiety yeah, I have, they've go through a year of therapy only to find out that that wasn't helpful. Mm-hmm. And so the questions that you may want to ask the therapist on the intake are questions like, do you know what ERP is? Do you use exposure and response prevention? Mm-hmm. What is your training in exposure and response prevention? If they don't know the answers to that right away, mm-hmm. this is not good. Right now, there are. I don't want to completely diss. There are some therapists who, let's say, if you live in a in a state where there are one, maybe two OCD therapists, they might say, "I don't know what that is, but let's you and I make sure we get yeah. resources and we'll go through this together." Given that I'm your only person, that's right. fine. There are workbooks that are very cheap. Um, there are resources like similar to what I've created mm-hmm. that can help therapists become trained and therapists can become trained through the IOCDF and there's a certification there. Yeah. So make sure you ask the right questions that will save you tons of time. Yeah. And I, I was trying to remind people that in the end, the therapist is working for you. So you have to advocate for yourself. And if you yeah. think those questions don't sound like the right answers, and beware of the old, oh, yeah, I, I do anxiety. I have patients with anxiety. Yeah. I'm sure you must yeah. hear it too. Yeah, oh, yeah, I have patients with OCD too. 
Right. Yeah. Right. It seems like it a very takes, specialized thing to work on. Right. It takes yeah. the average is seven to 14 years for someone with OCD to get the correct diagnosis and treatment. That's horrendous. That's terrible. Right? Yeah. It's terrible. So, you know, there's questions to ask. And I'm so grateful that, you know, to be on here and help if anyone, you know, has. Yeah. Just now in the early stages, hopefully that gives them some resources to move to. There are great workbooks as well. If you're, you know, that's sort of more of what you're able to do or wanting to do. Yeah. Some people do like to work on their own if possible. Mm -hmm. 30 Mm -hmm. seconds. Do you recommend it? I I feel that people are overcoming things like panic disorder, agoraphobia. I believe they, they can often do it on their own. If they have the right resources, the workbooks they read, they're in contact with people who are in the know. OCD. Can you tackle it on your own? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Is that going to be really hard? Yes. The Mm -hmm. problem is, is that um, when you're in your own thoughts, it's hard to kind of call yourself out on your own BS. You know what I mean? Um, So it's harder, but it's doable. People do it all the time. And the cool thing is there are resources out there like your podcast and, and, and things like that that are support groups, online support groups that can just help us along the way. I am a 100% believer that you can get better and live your best life. I want to make sure I add that doesn't mean you won't have anxiety and that you won't have intrusive thoughts, right. but you can live your best life with Correct. them. Yep. Um, that's why I want to make sure I say that because it's important to know. But yes, I, I have very much hope that people can get better and, and live their best life. That's great. Well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I so appreciate it. And maybe we'll get to do a few more of these at some point. Anytime. But, uh, give me um, your website is how do people get at you? So you can follow me on Instagram. It's Kimberly Quinlan. It's Mm -hmm. Kimberly with an E, -E Um, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-E-Y. Or you can find me. (laughs) Exactly, that's my Australian (laughs) spelling of words. Um, But if you're interested in any of the online resources, I have CBT School. See cognitivebehavioraltherapyschool.com. Yeah, it's great. I was on the site. You have a lot of really good stuff there. So you guys should check it out. All right, thanks, Kim. I'll talk to you again soon. All right, take care. I have to stop recording now the awkward part.